because as far as the treatment of blacks was concerned, Cleveland, unlike cities like Detroit or Philadelphia, had something to lose. Although the forest city had never dealt with blacks on a basis of complete equality, it had by the 1870s gone further toward that goal than most cities in the nation. Unlike Philadelphia, Cleveland never had segregated streetcars. Unlike Indianapolis, it had no segregated schools. Nor did the city have a tradition of interracial violence. As one abolitionist wrote in 1859, the feeling toward blacks in Cleveland and throughout the Western Reserve is very kind. And there they do better than in most places. There you find them master carpenters, master painters, shopkeepers, and growing rich every year. To be sure, this was an exaggeration. Not all of the city's Afro-Americans were, quote, growing rich every year. But the black community could boast a sizable number of success stories. And more importantly, the average income and occupational level of black Clevelanders was substantially higher than that of most urban blacks in the North. In 1870, almost a third of all black men in Cleveland were skilled craftsmen of various kinds, a figure substantially higher than that of the Irish immigrants residing in the city. Nor were blacks res residentially segregated at this time. Although they tended to cluster in certain sections of the city, no black ghetto existed. <clears throat> By 1915, much of this had changed. Most of the black newcomers to the city moved into the central Scoville Avenue uh, area between East 17th and East 55th Street one of the oldest and most crowded sections of the metropolis. Jane Edna Hunter, the nurse who would later found the Phyllis Wheatley Society, described her search for a place to stay in this section when she arrived in the city in 1905. Quote, the despairing search for lodgings up one dingy street and down another, ending with the acceptance of the least disreputable room we encountered. Although the central area was not a black ghetto, in the sense of being a completely segregated district, it was well on the way to becoming that. The gravitation of the black community to the central district, of course, was partly due to the fact that most newcomers were poor. But increasingly, black middle-class blacks also began making their home in this area. This was not accidental. There was a growing discrimination in property sales, and the influential black barbershop proprietor, George Myers, complained to a friend in 1916 that in some neighborhoods, realtors would not sell or rent to blacks, quote, no matter how much money we have to pay for the desired property, end quote. At the same time that the nascent ghetto was taking shape, black Clevelanders were suffering increasing discrimination in public accommodations. The schools at this time largely avoided the racist trend. Black students were not segregated in separate schools, nor placed in separate classrooms. But in many other areas, black residents watched with dismay as the institutional racism reared its ugly head, and the city's integrationist traditions failed. Exclusion from restaurants and hotels became commonplace, and soon the YMCA and YWCA were also keeping blacks out. In the city's hospitals, White administrators and physicians were united in opposing the admission of black doctors and nurses to their staffs. In 1915, Woman's Hospital began admitting black patients only on Saturday. What does this mean, one black woman asked. Are we to arrange to get sick on Saturday only? Soon most city hospitals were segregating blacks in separate wards. If integrated facilities were declining by the early 1900s, so too were the economic opportunities that Afro-Americans had enjoyed in Cleveland in the mid-19th century. Between 1870 and 1915, Cleveland emerged as a major industrial center, but blacks shared little in the opportunities for employment that industrialism created. Except for the most menial positions, blacks' uh, places in the booming mills and foundries were filled by foreign-born whites not native-born Americans of dark skin. The prejudice of corporate employers was often matched by that of the trade unions. The older skilled craft associations in the city, such as the carpenters and brick masons unions, did remain integrated, but the newer AFL unions usually excluded blacks entirely. Mr. Thompson, uh, in, who is 
been interviewed by Tom Campbell, uh, migrated to Cleveland with his family in 1901. And he described what it was like to be a, to be a black electrician around the time of World War I. Uh, I'm sorry that Tom and I think so much alike that he uh, read my mind about the uh, particular incident here. Uh, but let me quote directly from the interview with, with, uh, with Tom Campbell. Uh, question, what was it like working as an independent operator? Answer, I had the unions to worry with, but we had them on uh, old work because the unions didn't allow their men to work on old houses except from September till about Easter. It was too hot during the summer. But I'd go up into the hottest attic there was on the 4th of July if I got paid for it. What did I care? I could use the money. Question, you couldn't get into the union? Answer, no. Question, why? Answer, because my face was black. That's the only reason. Industrialization also created a greater need for white collar workers and managers to run the new corporate enterprises coming into being. To quote Mary, Ov Mary Ovington, an ex astute observer of black America in 1911, one can see the colored youth gazing wistfully through the office window at the clerk, whose business reaches across bewildering continents, knowing as he does that the employment he may find in that office will be emptying the white man's waste paper basket." End quote. Significantly, it was in the post office, a federally controlled occupation, that black Clevelanders made the only substantial breakthrough in clerical employment prior to 1930. As Harry C. Smith, editor of the Cleveland Gazette, noted in 1916, blacks employed by the city government were restricted to, quote, spittoon cleaning, garbage hauling, street cleaning, truck driving, and other jobs of that kind, end quote. They had little opportunity to rise to better positions. At that time, blacks would have found the ideas of the new federalism as unpalatable as many do today. Largely because of the increasing discrimination against black men, a growing percentage of black women found it necessary to obtain work outside the home. In 1900, black women in Cleveland were twice as likely to be to be wage earners as were immigrant women. Many white women who worked in their teens or early 20s then quit their jobs to devote full time to raising their families. Black women often found it impossible to, com to compartmentalize their lives so neatly. Employment of women in the new department stores was restricted to whites, mostly native born whites. When a Euclid Avenue department store hired two Negro saleswomen in 1919, and placed them conspicuously at the front of the store, it was an item worthy of mention in the black press. In some ways, the period between 1915 and 1930 represented for black Clevelanders a continuation of the trends of the preceding decades. In other ways, it was a time of improvement, albeit improvement circumscribed and limited in many ways. Progress in spite of adversity was the keynote of black Cleveland in the 1920s. As a result of heavy migration from the South, there were more blacks in Cleveland than ever before. The black population quadrupled between 1910 and 1920. It doubled again during the next decade. The influx into the city during World War I was, par was particularly large, and the drama of the great folk migration was well expressed by an editorial in a black newspaper. Quote, there is no mistaking what is going on. It is a regular exodus. It is without head, tail, or leadership. Its greatest factor is momentum, and this is increasing despite amazing efforts on the part of white Southerners to stop it. People are leaving their homes and everything about them under cover of night as though they were going on a day's journey, leaving forever. These newcomers entered a somewhat different environment than had the migrants at the turn of the century. Residentially, blacks had not been strictly segregated prior to World War I, and the central woodland area contained many Italian and Russian Jewish immigrants, as well as the bulk of the city's black community. Mr. Thompson relates that when he came with his family to Cleveland in 1901, quote, Cleveland seemed like a foreign country. Everybody was speaking Jewish or Italian or whatever. The neighborhoods that colored people lived in were the same neighborhoods that the immigrants who came over lived in, end quote. By the end of the 1920s, this situation had changed considerably. 
The Italians, and especially the Russian Jews, had left the central woodland area in large numbers, regrouping in enclaves in more outlying sections or dispersing throughout the city. By contrast, the black community expanded by filling in areas contiguous to the already existent black neighborhoods along Central and Scoville. By 1930, the section bounded by Euclid to the north and Woodland to the south were predominantly black, and many neighborhoods were now entirely segregated. The original area of black settlement could no longer accommodate the burgeoning black population, however, and the 1920s also witnessed a dramatic expansion of the black ghetto eastward. Mr. Thompson relates that when he and his wife first moved into an apartment on East 68th Street in 1920, they were the first black family on the block. By 1930, this neighborhood was predominantly black, as was much of the cedar woodland section between East 55th and East 105th. Expansion of the ghetto brought with it a clearer demarcation by social class within the black community. Outsiders unacquainted with the black community have tended to identify the ghetto with the world of the lower class. Actually, then and now, sections of the ghetto contain middle class or even elite neighborhoods. Roughly speaking, it is, it is possible to identify four zones within the black community at the end of the 1920s, each of progressively higher economic status as one moved eastward. The first zone in the area, between, uh, in the area west of East 40th Street was the oldest residential section of the Negro community. Filled with crowded and deteriorating lodging houses, this area had a high crime rate and was close to the soot and noise of the industrial district. <coughs> the area was marked by low home ownership and high illiteracy. As one moved eastward, illiteracy rates dropped and home ownership increased. Zone 2 stretched approximately from East 40th to East 55th Street. Although less crowded and further removed from the industrial section than Zone 1, this area was also deteriorating rapidly and beginning to take on the characteristics of a slum. Zone 3 between East 55th and East 79th Street had many more families owning homes than areas to the west. Only middle class or elite Negroes lived in Zone 4, the area beyond East 79th Street. A pleasant residential section, it had a population density less than one-third that of the lower Central Avenue District. Home ownership there was relatively common, while illiteracy was almost unknown. The black ghetto of the 1920s was a paradox of progress and poverty, and the meaning of the social changes that the black community was undergoing was to a large extent dependent upon the perspective of the observer. Most whites simply tried to avoid the ghetto, to escape from it, or to resist its encroachment. For these whites, when they gave the problem any thought at all, the ghetto was, an, was a convenient and altogether suitable place for containing what they considered to be an inferior race. But for the black people who were forced to live in it, the ghetto had a much more ambiguous meaning. In innumerable ways, the average black citizen was more isolated from the general life of the urban community than he had ever been since the founding of the city. Yet paradoxically, it was this very isolation and the sense of unique goals and needs that it fostered that helped you to unify the black community and provided the practical basis for the future struggle against racism in all of its manifestations. The emergence of the ghetto in the 1920s made possible the beginnings of black political influence, which later generations would expand upon. There was one main reason why social class divisions did not divide the city's black community excessively at this time. Racial discrimination, which reached new levels of intensity during the post-war period, affected almost all blacks, even the most successful. Between 1915 and 1928, a string of Republican administrations in Cleveland refused to appoint Afro-Americans to anything but the most minor positions. This despite black loyalty to the GOP. Local government paid little attention to the needs of the ex expanding black population. In the central and woodland districts, recreational facilities were scarce, garbage removal irregular, the streetcars notorious for poor service and shoddy conditions. As far as police protection is concerned, black people could say without contradiction that they received both too little and too much. 
City Hall made no effort to clean up the gambling and prostitution rackets on Lower Central, and the number of police assigned to black areas was inadequate. But when police did enter the ghetto to make an arrest, they were often unnecessarily brutal. Part of the problem was the lack of black police. Incredibly, there were only a dozen black officers on the force in 1930. Under these circumstances, discrimination against blacks in public accommodations went largely unchecked. Hotels excluded Negroes in the 1920s. Some restaurants placed white-only signs in their windows. Theaters seated blacks in the balcony. In light of Cleveland's traditions, however, the most insidious change occurred in the public school system where a subtle process of discrimination began to take hold. Although, most black although black teachers remained integrated in the system, this was no longer true for black students. By 1930, almost 90% of all black junior high school students attended four schools, while six out of 10 black high school students went to a single institution, Central High. This trend was not due entirely to the expansion of all black neighborhoods. In 1933, black parents complained that black children on the east side were often being forced to attend Central High rather than schools nearer to their homes. Conversely, it was charged that white students within the Central High district were allowed to transfer to other schools. Much later, in the 1970s and 80s, advocates of turning government back to the people would oppose busing for the purpose of racial integration. The historical irony is that at the time when such powers had been in the hands of the local school board, they had established something equivalent to busing, not for the purpose of ending segregation, but as a means of furthering it. As the student body of some schools became predominantly black in the 1920s, their curricula changed from an emphasis on liberal arts to the stressing of skills of a more mundane nature. In 1933, the local NAACP discovered that over half of the 10th grade students at Central were getting no training in mathematics at all. Most of the home economics courses at the school emphasized laundry work, and such standard electives as languages, bookkeeping, and stenography had usually been dropped from the curriculum. These changes undoubtedly lowered the expectation of many black students and oriented them at an early age toward lower paying, less prestigious occupations. Once a powerful force for equality, by the 1930s, the public schools had too often become yet another example of racial injustice. And yet, despite the increasing segregation and discrimination that blacks encountered in Cleveland after 1915, thousands of migrants decided to make their home in the city. They were drawn to Cleveland, as to other northern centers, by the lure of economic opportunity. With the virtual end of immigration from, ab from abroad during World War I, employers found it convenient to drop their earlier prejudice against black labor. For the first time, black workers found industrial occupations open to them. Most of the new job openings were in the area of unskilled labor, but blacks made substantial gains in semi-skilled and skilled factory work as well. Though underfinanced, the black businesses in the city also indirectly benefited from the, from the new clientele made possible by the expanding black population in the 1920s. This improvement in black economic status was the result neither of local initiative nor federal intervention. It derived entirely from the operation of impersonal economic forces in an economy now dominated by large corporations, nationally integrated, so that changes in one part of the economic system immediately reverberated throughout the rest of that system. The Republican administrations in Washington during the 1920s would not have thought of using government to aid the black, the poor, or even the average working class white person. Support the elite, promote corporate enterprise, and the rest would take care of itself. So the theory ran. It is not for nothing that Calvin Coolidge is Ronald Reagan's favorite president. And for a while, it did work, even for blacks. 
at least those blacks who had migrated to the cities. But those today who yearn for a return to an era of unfettered capitalism have forgotten what the end result of that system was when it actually existed. They have forgotten 1929. As far as black Clevelanders are concerned, it must be emphasized that the hiring of blacks during and after World War I by corporate managers indicated no concern for racial equality on their part. The proof of this is the response that this elite gave to blacks who attempted to move out of the ghetto. In the 1920s, the native white Protestant elite, having benefited enormously from the growth of the city, began to desert it for the then exclusive suburbs of Shaker, Garfield, and Cleveland Heights. Having done so, they set up a color bar against successful members of the black middle class, and they did not hesitate to use violence in an attempt to enforce it. Whites in Shaker Heights twice dynamited the house of the prominent black physician Charles Garvin in an unsuccessful effort to force him to move. Another black man, Arthur Hill, decided to sell his new home in Garfield Heights rather than face the continued threats of white mobs. During the decade of the 20s, black industrial workers put a great deal of trust in the system of unfettered capitalism. The migrant workers were, in the words of a survey of Cleveland business firms published in 1924, quote, loyal to their northern employers to the best of their ability, end quote. For vastly different reasons, blacks and their employers both distrusted labor unions. But when push came to shove at the end of the 20s, and the, and the declining production forced businesses to reduce their workforce, black workers discovered that their loyalty was not always returned in kind. A Cleveland Urban League official reported that in some factories, quote, the colored worker is the first to go, end quote. When a, lay when a layoff occurred. And in 1930, the heaviest concentration of the um, unemployed was in the central woodland area. <clears throat> Suffering grievously from discrimination and unemployment, black Clevelanders retained one unquestioned right, the franchise, a right incidentally, which they had obtained in, 19, in, in 1870 in Ohio as a result of the 15th Amendment to the Federal Constitution. Increasingly, in the late 1920s and 1930s, they used it. By electing independent candidates to city council, black voters were able to significantly increase the political patronage available to the black community. By voting against new hospital bonds, they helped force the integration of city hospital as well as the integration of doctors and nurses on the hospital staff. Finally, the huge majorities which blacks in Cleveland and throughout the North gave Franklin Roosevelt in 1936 signaled a fundamental shift in political allegiance. Even more so than the, whites, than, uh, than the white ethnic groups who became part of the New Deal coalition, blacks were willing to embrace an activist federal administration because in the long run, it represented their best hope for justice. <clears throat> and so we return to the issue I raised at the beginning of this presentation, the new federalism, which is really the old anti-federalism, and how the history of black Cleveland before 1930 illuminates some of its flaws. When blacks questioned the beneficence of turning power back to the states and to already overburdened cities, they know whereof they speak. They know from their own historical experience that the new federalism is fraught with danger. They have seen the past, and it did not work. Thank you. Mm -hmm.